Hello everyone, I'm Andrew and I'm going to talk about Ostrowski's theorem. So first we want to understand the idea of an absolute value. So given a field k, an absolute value is a function double bar from k to the real numbers that satisfies the following properties for any two elements x and y of the field. 1. The absolute value of x is greater than or equal to 0. 2. The absolute value of x is 0 if and only if x is itself the 0 element of the field. 3. The absolute value of the product of x and y is the product of the absolute values of x and y and this is called multiplicativity. Uh, four, the absolute value of the sum of x and y is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values of x and y, and you may recognize this as the triangle inequality. So from these four axioms, we can deduce a couple basic properties about any absolute value. So for one, it always sends the one of the field to the real number one. Two, the absolute value of negative x is equal to the absolute value of x for any arbitrary element of the field. And three, the absolute value of the quotient of two elements, a and b, is equal to the quotient of the absolute values of a and b. Um, so now we'll look at a few examples of important absolute values. And for the sake of time, I won't prove that any of them actually satisfy those four axioms. But in general, the proofs are not too difficult. So if we let a double bar sub infinity from the real numbers to the real numbers be the sort of usual absolute value we're, we're used to seeing, um, in other words, it sends non-negative numbers to themselves and negative numbers to the negative of themselves, then this is indeed an absolute value on the real numbers. And importantly, we can restrict it to an absolute value on just the rational numbers if we want to. Um, so next, if we fix a prime p, and uh, then we can write any rational number as x equals p to the n times a over b, where n is some integer, and a and b are co-prime integers not divisible by p. Uh, then consider the function double bar sub p from the rationals to the reals, um, defined by um, double bar sub p of x is 0 if and only if x is itself 0, and then p to the negative n otherwise then double bar sub p is an absolute value on the rationals and we call it the p-adic absolute value. Um, so just for as an example of how this works, if we consider the rational number 56 thirds, um, observe that we can write it as two cubed times seven over three, where seven over three are seven and three are co-prime and neither is divisible by two. Um, so then the two-adic absolute value of 56 thirds is two to the negative three, in other words, one over eight. Um, and finally, for any field k, the function double bar sub 0, um, k into r, that's defined by um, 0 if and only if x is 0 and 1 for any non-zero element of the field. This is also an absolute value, albeit a relatively simple one, and we call it the trivial absolute value. And then any other absolute value that doesn't observe this exact rule will be then called non-trivial. Okay, so given the various examples of absolute values we just saw, it's reasonable to ask how many different absolute values over a given field there are. And Ostrowski's theorem actually gives a surprising answer to this question for the field of rationals. But before we see that, we first need a way to equate absolute values to each other. So to this end, let k be a field and double bar and double bar star be two non-trivial absolute values on that field k. Then we say they're equivalent if there is some positive real number c such that double bar of x is equal to double bar star of x to the c for all x in the field. And we can actually show that this relation defines a proper equivalence relation, i.e. it's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. But for the sake of time, I think I'm going to have to skip over it, but the sketch of the proof is below. Um, so it turns out that if we want to verify that two absolute values over the rationals are equivalent, we only need to verify the relation for natural numbers greater than or equal to 2. So for 1, from our remarks earlier, we know that the relation will have to be true for the numbers 0 and 1. And then if we have some non-negative rational number x equal to m over n, uh, we can simply use the fact that the, quotient, the absolute value of a quotient is equal to the quotient of the absolute values um, to get our desired relation. And then using that and the fact that the absolute value of negative x is equal to the absolute value of x, we can also verify the relation for um, negative rationals. So therefore, the relation is true for all rationals. Um, so now I'll introduce Ostrowski's theorem itself. Um, essentially, it states that uh, if double bar is a non-trivial absolute value on Q, then it's equivalent to either um, double bar infinity, the usual absolute value, or uh, some p-adic absolute value for some prime p. So to prove this, we'll consider two cases. So on one hand, if double bar of n is less than or equal to 1 for all natural numbers n, then we'll show that double bar has to be equivalent to double bar sub p for some prime, some, some prime p. And two, if there is some natural number greater than or equal to 2, 
such that double bar of n is strictly greater than one, then we'll show that double bar has to be equivalent to double bar sub infinity, the usual absolute value. Okay, so let's tackle case one. So assume that absolute value of n is less than or equal to one for all natural numbers n. Then since double bar is non-trivial, there is some natural number greater than or equal to two, um, such that its absolute value is less than one. And then we can factor this, uh, this natural number into uh, the, the product of primes. Um, and since the absolute value of n is less than one, we have to have that the absolute value of p is less than one for some prime dividing n. Now assume q is another prime with absolute value of q less than one. Um, we can then choose a natural number big N such that absolute, absolute value of P to the N and absolute value of Q to the N are both strictly less than one half. Um, and further, since P and Q are both primes, we can use the Euclidean algorithm to find um, integers S and T such that S times P to the big N plus T times Q to the big N is equal to one. Um, but then we can apply the, uh, our absolute value to both sides and use the multiplicativity property um, as well as the fact that absolute value of p to the n and absolute value of q to the n are less than one half to get that a contradiction that one is less than one. So we have to have that p is the only prime um, whose absolute value is strictly less than one. So now let a equal negative log absolute value of p over log p. Note that this is going to be greater than zero since um, absolute value of p is less than one. Um, and then note that we can use some algebra to show that p to the negative a is equal to just absolute value of p. So then for all natural numbers greater than or equal to two, write n equal to p to the k times n prime, where um, p and n prime are relatively prime. Um, and so since p does not divide n prime, we must have um, that its absolute value is strictly one. So then we get that the absolute value of n is equal to the absolute value of p to the k times n prime, which is again going to be equal to absolute value of p to the k times the absolute value of n prime. Um, we can do some more rearranging essentially to get that this is then equal to absolute value of n, um, the p-adic absolute value of n to the a. Um, and as n was an arbitrary natural number greater than two, it follows from that remark above that um, absolute value double bar is equivalent to double bar sub p for that specific prime p. Okay, so now we'll consider the second case of the proof. And since I don't have a ton of time, I'll unfortunately have to skim through it. Um, so first assume that there's a natural number n prime greater than or equal to two, whose absolute value is strictly greater than one. Then pick m and n to be integers greater than one and write m in base n via m equals the sum from i equals zero to k of a sub i times n to the i. Then if we let big n be the maximum of one and the absolute value of little n, um, then we, we can use things like the triangle inequality and multiplicativity of our absolute value to arrive at this um, inequality here. Um, then for an arbitrary positive integer t, we can actually substitute m to the t for m in that above inequality and get this bottom one here. Um, but then t was an arbitrary uh, natural number greater than zero. We can actually take the limit as t goes to infinity of both sides of that inequality. And we can show that this implies that the absolute value of n is less than or equal to big N to the log base n of m. Um, then we can use our assumption to choose that, to choose an m um, such that m absolute value of m is strictly greater than one. Um, and then we can ultimately arrive at this inequality here based on a little more algebra. Um, we can then actually repeat the entire argument, but swap the roles of m and n and we'll get equality above. Um, so for an arbitrary m and n greater than or equal to two as natural numbers, we have this equality. Then if we let c be this common value, then we can use a little bit of logarithm manipulation to show that um, absolute value of n is equal to the usual absolute value of n to the natural log of c, which is gonna be some positive real number for all natural numbers n greater than or equal to two. And so by the remark above, we have that our absolute value is indeed equivalent to um, double bar infinity. Okay, so overall, Ostrowski's theorem has told us something pretty remarkable, which is that despite whatever it may look like on the surface, any non-trivial absolute value on the rationals is actually just one of two possible and well understood absolute values, namely the usual one and the p-adic one. So this leads us to ask, is this true of other fields we may be interested in other than the rationals? So for instance, if we consider the field q adjoins square root of two, for an arbitrary element x equals a plus b times square root of two in that field, let double bar one and double bar two um, be defined by the first one sending, um, sending a plus b square root of two to a plus b square root of two in the usual 
um, in the usual absolute value and the other one sending a plus b squared of 2 to a minus b squared of 2 in the usual absolute value. So then we can show that double bar 1 and double bar 2 are both non-trivial absolute values over that field q adjoined square root of 2 and yet they are not equivalent. So clearly we can't just naively apply the version of Ostrowski's theorem we just saw here to any extension of the rational numbers. Um, but it does turn out that there is actually a way to extend Ostrowski's theorem to finite extensions of q to get a similar result. Unfortunately, there's not enough time to get into that here, and so I'll just say thanks for watching and enjoy the break.